ビデオ In 1991, a specter was haunting arcades across the globe. The specter of fighting games. When Capcom released the sequel to 1987's Street Fighter, Street Fighter II The World Warrior, the world of video games was forever changed. All of a sudden, Japanese game studios were putting time and resources into making their own fighting games and directly competing with Capcom. This led to the development of many classic early 90s fighting games such as Tekken, Art of Fighting, Samurai Showdown, Darkstalkers, Virtua Fighter, World Heroes, The Outfoxies, Battle Arena Toshinden, Voltage Fighter Gaokaiser, Fighting Vipers, and of course, the franchise that stood head and shoulders above them all, Fighter's History. And as with anything that took the Japanese pop cultural landscape by storm, there was plenty of merchandising surrounding these franchises, and you better believe that included anime. The 90s anime scene was smothered in TV specials, OVAs, and movies based on fighting games, and most, if not all of them, were some of the few animes at the time that got localized ASAP. This fighting game boom was not exclusive to Japan, this was a global thing. If companies like Capcom, SNK, and Namco wanted to retain a fanbase and wring as much international cash out of said fanbase, they had to strike while the iron was white hot. What were they gonna do? Wait for the Americans to make their own adaptations? <laughs> oh, this is delicious! I didn't think so. As for the actual quality of these kinds of animes, well. Let me just say that the number of gems in these kinds of anime are quite few, but for today, I think we will start things off with an anime that some people would even go so far as to call a classic. The armor of Mars will be mine, and when I possess it all, I will become a god! <laughs> Feel the storm, it's coming. Nineteen ninety four saw the release of Fatal Fury the Motion Picture. At the time, SNK was one of the biggest powerhouses of arcade gaming competing hard with Capcom and Fatal Fury was their flagship franchise. If anyone asked if there was a fighting game franchise that could easily go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Street Fighter in those days, the answer would almost always be Mortal Kombat, to be fair. But the Fatal Fury franchise would have also been an acceptable answer, especially in Japan. The Fatal Fury franchise can easily be attributed as a source of several iconic fighting game characters. Billy Kane, Kim Kapwon, Joe Higashi, Mai Shiranai, Geese Howard, and of course, the face of the franchise and possibly SNK itself, Terry Bogard. Are you okay? <laughs> oh! A franchise defined by memorable characters, joystick snappingly hard boss fights, and digitized bad English pretty much demanded an anime adaptation from the get go, and it certainly got it. Though interestingly, Fatal Fury the Motion Picture isn't exactly an adaptation of the games. It's actually a sequel to the two TV specials that were straight adaptations of the first two games respectively, Legend of the Hungry Wolf and The New Battle. Fatal Fury the Motion Picture is an entirely original story with entirely original characters. Taking place right after Fatal Fury 2 The New Battle, Harry Bogard and his brother Andy, along with Mai and Joe, are asked by a mysterious girl named Sulia to track the remaining pieces of the all-powerful Armor of Mars. The Armor of Mars was the armor of the legendary warrior Godimus, whom the heroes discover invented many of the martial arts moves seen throughout the series. Sulia is a descendant of Godimus as well as her brother Laucorn. 
Laocorn, who has already gathered half the armor pieces, seeks the rest to become an all-powerful god. The mission given by Sulia to Terry and the gang is to stop Laocorn and his lackeys from not only gaining that power, but also using that power to unleash the spirit of the armor and rain destruction on the entire world. But if my brother manages to collect all six pieces, the curse of Godimus will overtake him. His power will be beyond human. Beyond. And so begins a globetrotting adventure full of sick fighting scenes, character cameos, and skimpy swimsuits. First, let's get into the thing that pops out to you the most when you first view this anime. The animation style. It is certainly a... unique style. Angular faces with soft edges, top heavy with skinny midriffs, eyes that are either sharp and narrow or big and round, the men's bodies emphasizing their muscular athleticism, the women's bodies emphasizing their... assets. Those who are well-versed in anime of this era will instantly recognize this style because it is the calling card of a very well-known animator, character designer, and director that was huge in the 90s. In other words, it's time we talk about a very special boy. Masame Obari. Known primarily for his incredible work at designing Mecha in the 80s, he was good enough that he held a lot of 90s anime, both as a designer and a director. And his work on the Fatal Fury franchise is probably his most well-known. As far as his direction goes, Obari-san is, um... How should we put this? A guilty pleasure at best. You can't deny that the way he draws humans is not the most aesthetically pleasing. While they do have a vaguely human shape and certainly do resemble the characters from the original, it is easy to understand why this would turn people off when Obari has a tendency to completely disregard consistent anatomy. If anatomy gets in the way of a cool or sexy pose, then out the window it goes. Like, there is a reason why parallels have been drawn between him and other big-time 90s artist Rob Liefeld. Obari is a very self-indulgent artist, especially when it comes to animating the ladies and the bouncing pair of balloons they all have in place of breasts. You just know he was in hog heaven when he got the chance to direct the animation for my most famous pair of honkers in video game history, Shiranai. But there are some things about Obari's animation direction that do in fact work for this anime. Aside from his love of lady pecs, Obari is also a lover of spectacle, and boy does that love help here. This isn't Fatal Fury the series, this is Fatal Fury the goddamn motion picture. So it would behoove Obari to make sure that the fight scenes are as fluid and as climactic as possible. Each punch hits hard, each kick hits hard, each dodge feels like a close shave, and you gotta love the absurdity of nearly everyone ripping their clothes off in lovingly rendered detail to reveal their fighting outfits underneath them. And Obari is not averse to the runny eggs effect. This is usually seen in Gainax and Trigger Productions, where the characters go deliberately off-model to better smooth out the action. Some people might not be a fan of this technique, but I'll take it over excessive speed lines. But probably the best thing about Fatal Fury the motion picture animation-wise is that it's not afraid to look cinematic. And it really adds a lot of gravitas to otherwise inconsequential scenes, like this one of Joe preparing for his big comeback fight. <sighs> Regardless, good fight scene animation and direction can only have so much impact. To really pack a punch, a story needs to be behind said punches. Well, it does start off very well. Right before the screen appears, we get the MacGuffin established, we get the villains and their powers established, we get the importance of said MacGuffin established, we get the villains' motivations established, and finally, we establish the hero who is going to stop them all. It's a perfect setup, and it's a shame it's the most well-paced part of the story. Yeah, one issue Fatal Fury the Motion Picture has is that it contains quite a few pacing problems. 
Most of the first half of the movie is either devoted to our four heroes globetrotting to find the locations of the armor of Mars after finding out the piece where they thought it was isn't actually where it was. Nearly everything of value is said to have been carried off to Europe. That's probably where the armor of Mars went too. Oh, great. Or developing the budding romance between Terry and Sulia. We'll get back to that. And for a movie that has a climax full of drama, high stakes, and the pushing of limits to nail the final blow, it really kind of ends right after the dust settles. No denouement, no shots of the characters turning to each other and talking about what lessons they learned that day, just a shot of Terry throwing his hat in the air and a fade to credits. Maybe we aren't supposed to take this film seriously? I mean, the localization sure doesn't think so. I highly recommend watching this in English because it is some of the goofiest voice acting and localization that only the 90s could have wrought. To the point I'm shocked some of these lines haven't become more quotable in the past few years. Yeah, and that there is the finishing move he used to put me in the hospital. If I read too many words in a row, I get sleepy. Oh, that bastard just wrecked my brand new nightclub! I'll get you, man! Yeah, man, I saw your sister naked. And there are, of course, some standout performances, such as Lauhorn, who sounds like an alumnus from San Dimas High. You seem to be more than adequately qualified, Terry Bogard. I am about to transcend time and humanity and become a god. It'll be most triumphant. And then there's the voice of one of Lauhorn's henchmen, Howard. Take a good look at him and guess how he sounds like. Now, now, one false move and his young lady will become most unhappy. Oh, 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 he is a treat and a half. Each syllable is dripping with so much sadistic fabulousness it makes Vega sound like he's phoning it in. As I recall, Jamin doesn't care much for my style. Fight fair and square. Don't kick them when they're down. <laughs> That's your way, isn't it? Well, I'm different. I use any means possible. But I guess it's foolish of me to expect seriousness from a movie based on a franchise that has the line, Die like your father, you pinheaded son of an ice cream maker. But even if the story was tightly paced, and even if the localization took itself dead seriously, it doesn't really help that Fatal Fury the motion picture has a high point of entry. For one thing, it's a sequel. There are so many callbacks to the last two anime that the average viewer going in blind has a good chance of getting lost. The anime begins with Joe's big comeback fight after being injured by the last villain of the last anime, Krauser. They visit Krauser's castle where the climax of the last anime took place. There's even an extended scene involving Terry seeing visions of his dead girlfriend who was killed off in the first anime. Second off, Fatal Fury the motion picture was made entirely with an audience of Fatal Fury fans in mind. A bit self-evident, I know, but if you go into this without even a basic knowledge of what the Fatal Fury franchise is or who its characters are, you are essentially throwing yourself to the Hungry Wolves. There are so many scenes in this anime that revolve around cameos of known Fatal Fury cast members, and they are mostly designed to get a pop from the audience screaming, I know who that is! This scene right here is probably the best example. Raging Storm! What the hell was that? That was nothing. So long as this wound remains unhealed, my power will only continue to grow. If that bastard gets stronger than this, I don't want to know about it. Terry Bogard. That right there is Geese Howard, Terry Bogard's arch nemesis. The guy who killed Terry's father, girlfriend, and master. The guy who Terry fought and presumably killed at the end of Legend of the Hungry Wolf. Only now we know he is alive and pissed, training in secrecy and waiting for the day he can finally take his revenge on Terry. The Fatal Fury fans in the audience are going nuts, foaming at the mouth and rending their Neo Geo t-shirts in unbridled ecstasy. The main villain of the franchise is back, baby! The non-Fatal Fury fans in the audience, however, are left scratching their heads and wondering, who is this guy again? So yeah, in order to get the most out of this movie, you need to be a Fatal Fury fan. But unfortunately, watching this as a Fatal Fury fan comes with its own set of problems. 
So, Geese Howard, is he going to appear in the climax of the movie, or even the rest of the movie at all? Yeah, that's what I thought. All the cameos of the various Fatal Fury fighters aside from our four mains are exactly that. Cameos. Most have little impact on the story at large and are only there for fan service reasons. Barely any of them get to actually fight, and those who do are actually doing so for the purpose of jobbing to the villains. The only one of them who actually has a complete fight is Kim Kapwan against a mass brainwashed Chin, and that's only to get him injured so he can be sidelined for the rest of the movie. The main cast has it better, but not by much. Unless they are fighting random goons, they spend most of the movie getting their collective asses kicked. Which is not bad per se, it actually does a great job in establishing how the villains of this film are actually leagues above our heroes, and are quite possibly the greatest threat any of them have ever faced. Hell, in his first battle with Laucorn, Terry almost gets himself killed and has to have Sulia carry him out of the battle. But then again, all this build up for the henchmen seems kind of misused when it ultimately ends with Mai and Andy taking out Howard and Pawnee with a few well placed punches to the face. Didn't really lead to the knockdown drag out fight we were hoping for here, huh? Still better than Jamin who lets Terry win just so he can fight Laucorn. Joe doesn't even get to fight with the henchmen. That fight at the beginning with Hua Jai? That was the only fight he wins in this movie. Everything after that is nothing but ass kickings and If I read too many words in a row, I get sleepy. At the very least, the final confrontation with Laucorn is a very climactic and knockout drag out fight we were hoping for, with our four heroes barely managing to hold their own against the superpowered Ted Theodore Logan. But this leads to one of my big problems with the movie, Sulia. Sulia is barely a character. She is 25% party white mage, 25% plot device that tells the party where to go next, and 50% exposition fairy. Her very existence is why this movie has a huge show don't tell problem. He built an empire which stretched from southern Europe to western Asia, right around the third century. But Alexander couldn't stop thinking about the power he'd seen, so he asked Godimus to come to Babylon. And that's when Alexander... such fear of Godimus, they set a trap and burned him to death. But the armor... Half of it. He wanted the power! My father was an archaeologist, and the ruins on Rhodus Island were the biggest discovery of his career. After whether that, the location the was never found, was soon and the or whether we're just not then, seeing it, my brother had begun his own is, search for the ruins. And her whole bare bones characterization ultimately cripples the secondary plot of the movie, the relationship between her and Terry. The movie spends a lot of time developing this relationship between Sulia and Terry. They declare to protect each other. They have awkward conversations in the hallway with each other. The ghost of Terry's dead girlfriend shows up to him and tells him he needs to move on. They have an intimate moment where Sulia lies on top of him naked so Terry can be fully healed from the wounds he got from fighting Laucorn. And it's treated like this serious, intimate moment between two Starcross lovers, and I am not feeling any of it. There's very little chemistry between these two characters because one of them has the personality of a dry erase board. We know what Sulia's backstory is, but do we know who Sulia is in the present? What are her likes? What are her dislikes? What separates her from the thousands of other generic shonen love interests? The minor subplot of Mai trying to get horizontal with Andy's clueless ass has more romance than this. In spite of all these problems, Fatal Fury the Motion Picture is still a perfectly serviceable action movie, but that's kind of what the Fatal Fury franchise is all about. Despite a few pitfalls in terms of pacing and the way characters both old and new are used, the fight scenes are good enough to mitigate all of those problems. It's worth sitting through just to see some good old fashioned martial arts action. And Fatal Fury the Motion Picture did its job. We the audience wanted to see some good fist fights, and damn it, we the audience got some good fist fights. Each empty night I fight against the light that is my destiny. 